Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us this Friday morning. Um, glad to be joined uh, with Charles Campbell, our guest this morning on the localization uh, fireside chat. I appreciate your time with us this morning, Charles. Uh, Charles and I go back, way back. I haven't met you in person yet. I'm uh, hoping to make it to Brazil for the conference um, and where I get the chance to meet you and your and your colleagues uh, from uh, Wantos. And uh, look forward to that, uh, by the way. I, uh, I hope I can make it. It's just uh, March is a busy time of year for all of us here in, in the Northern Hemisphere from a translation perspective. So it's busy time. So thanks again for being with me this morning. I really appreciate your time. And I see you got your coffee with you. So we'll get going. Uh, first question, I guess, on people's mind, if you don't mind, introduce yourself. You know, Tell us a little bit about you have many responsibilities, I know, from your profile. You've got Transition Back Office. You've got Skuntos. Um, you've got many, many, uh, many responsibilities. Just a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today, Robin. It's a pleasure. I am looking forward to seeing you in Rio de Janeiro on March 24, March 25 at Puntos. Um, yeah, well, my story goes back a long way uh, to the 1990s when I uh, was living in New Zealand, which is where I'm from. It's uh, sort of like Canada with great beaches and, and small. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've been working in the translation, interpreting, and localization industry basically since 1997. Uh, and I've done almost every role there is to do. I've been a project manager, a vendor manager, a quality manager. I've worked as a translator, an editor, a proofreader, a salesperson. Uh, I've worked in accounting and finance, so I've been around the block, and uh, it's been a fantastic ride. I've uh, had the privilege of meeting the most amazing people in the world. I've traveled the world as well, um, including Canada several times uh, for work, and have been always been able to mix in a bit of work and pleasure. You know, we work in localization, we work in globalization. You have to know the world. Um, you know, that's what I say uh, to my wife, you know, I have to, I have to do these trips and make these investments. Uh, anyway, so it's been a, it's been a fantastic journey so far. And uh, uh, I must say, I really, really enjoy my work. Uh, and at this time, I'm balancing uh, the day between Vamos Juntos, the conference that we're organizing in Rio de Janeiro, March 24 and March 25. Uh, and of course, my role as president of translation back office. And of course, many family responsibilities. I have three kids and another uh, baby on the way in a couple of months. So busy times. Growing family, growing family and growing business, I hope. So, Certainly, uh, business is good and, and family is better. Absolutely. So over the years, you've, you know, you've, you've seen a lot of changes. So what sticks to your mind uh, since you've started early uh, your career in the, uh, in the in the localization business, as you saw the industry, I'm sure you saw some transformation. So what's what comes to mind uh, the most evidence of change? Gosh, well, where to begin? I mean, obviously technology. I remember doing um, translations where you would get the translation faxed to you, or even worse, a scan of a fax that was very difficult to read or a box sent to you by FedEx or DHL uh, that maybe got some water leaking in and damaging the documents. I mean, these are war stories from the 1990s. Um, uh, I've certainly seen a lot of changes. Um, I think that almost all of the changes have been good and there's been some, some battles along the road that were, that were lost in terms of um, I don't like this technology, I'm not going to use it, or, or some such and such. Uh, but it's been a very interesting ride, and uh, I see a very, very healthy industry. I feel I see solid growth. Uh, I think the drivers that are behind the growth in the translation, interpreting, and localization industry are very strong in terms of government-mandated work. Uh, and uh, globalization in the private sector. And when I see globalization in the private sector, I see companies that need to globalize, need to be uh, more and more present in emerging markets around the world. 
And if you're not there, then you lose by default. If you don't have your, your commercial material, your website, your technical documentation in multiple languages, then you are giving up on selling in those markets. Uh, and uh, so I think that's a very solid pillar, a, a driver that is pushing work in, in the direction of our industry. And then of course, government mandated work. And the government is not mandating work for translators, interpreters, and localizers just because they want to. It is happening because there is a driver behind the driver, which is growth and immigration, growth in refugee communities and limited English proficiency communities, a growth in awareness and consciousness that language access is a right. This is this is um, growing at different speeds and different depths and different places. Um, for example, Canada, uh, obviously, there's a very high level of awareness uh, around French, but also around other languages as well. Um, in the United States, it depends a lot on the different communities, different counties or states, depending on the limited English, English proficiency uh, users and speakers, community members in each place. And uh, I, I see nothing that will stop this trend it's an irreversible trend as far as I see. Um, so that makes me, well, feel happy to be part of this industry, happy to be working with the people I'm working with. So um, to take this a little step further, which you and I have talked about this before, the you know, technologies in, you know, technology is uh, um, prevalent now in our industry as opposed to where it was you know, two decades ago. And, um, but at the same time, and I, know, and I know you share the same opinion, is that volume in our industry in general keeps going up like if you look across you know the reports that you see the statistics that you see from csa research and a few others you notice that the revenue for these companies are going up so revenue so translation translation technologies or technologies in general did not really take away business it gave us the opportunity as an industry to create more opportunities do you agree with that statement oh yes there's a world of opportunities now that weren't there when i was at university uh, in the mid 1990s. It's an exciting time. Uh, gosh, if, if only I'd had the access to the opportunities that are present now back in the, in the mid 1990s. Um, I think it's a very exciting time and you hear this kind of doomsday talk. Oh, big recession, it's gonna derail us. Or the pandemic, it's gonna derail us. Or, um, machine translation is going to derail us. I was going to say GPT-3, but... <laughs> no, yeah. We're going to be uh, glorified post-editors. I mean, 15 years ago, everyone was saying, you know, you've got to improve your post-editing skills because there's not going to be any more translation work. I've, I've heard this um, over and over. And now, of course, chat, um, which someone said to me that if you say that in French, it, it means something completely different. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I can't repeat that on the call. Uh, I don't believe in any of that. I think that we're in a very interesting moment, a, a very interesting juncture in our in our ecosystem. There's lots of things that need to be improved. For example, uh, the number of people studying translation in English speaking countries is either stable or dropping, depending on where you are. And that is really bad. But the number of people studying translation in other countries where English is not the main language is growing fast. So it's very interesting, different realities in the economy. We have uh, full employment or near full employment in many countries, and we have tremendous levels of unemployment in other countries in the <clears> world. Um, so there's lots of things going on behind the scenes um it's it's not a rising tide that will automatically lift all boats equally yeah but it, it is a very interesting and dynamic market and i don't believe any of the doomsday talk no um if you looked at things a year ago at this time we were supposed to be heading into a brutal and cruel recession it hasn't happened yet not in this industry of course there are economic realities that are swirling around us, complicating things. 
yep. making life hard. But that's no one. No one said it was meant to be easy. Yeah. No. I. I you know, for for us as an industry, uh, one of the um, key factor, and and you know, uh, for us is like when the business or economy is going up, you see a lot of content being generated uh, for that. You know, in corresponding to the economic growth, and at the same time, when the economy uh, is not having fun, and you know, we're on a downturn, you see content being created. Of course. Most most major companies, when the revenues go down, they would like to go out to the market, encourage the market. So marketing campaigns gets created, more pushed to sell harder, if you will, for for lack of a better word, and which creates more content. Which brings me to the next topic, where we see a rise in content creation, and we saw that tidal wave coming from a content perspective as the tools become more available for people to create content or to get the word out. Uh, uh, so content is is rising. Quite a bit in the past few years, and you know, estimate puts it between thirty to forty percent per year growth. And going back to your point, you're right. If you need to translate that content by all of it using manual, the old-fashioned way, translators sitting in a in a room translating, you would need a large army. I don't think we have enough humanity to translate that. So, hence, you know, technology is really helping get the message out to those demographics where they did not have access. To a specific language and their language of choice, and getting more translation done and creating more opportunities. And you guys are, you know, I want to put a plug here for the uh, for the association that you've uh, founded, you and your colleagues, the uh, Juntos uh, Association. So, what drove you to that, and what's the concept behind it? That's a very good question. So, Juntos, which means together in Spanish, or Juntos also means together in Portuguese, just different pronunciation, um, came about uh, during the pandemic. I reached out to many other people in the translation, interpreting, and localization industry in Latin America that I personally knew, and a whole bunch of people I didn't know, and they were really surprised to hear from me. And I said, you know, let's form an association. Uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, you have two associations of companies, translation, interpreting, localization companies in Argentina. You have an, uh, a relatively new association in Brazil. And then in Mexico, Colombia, Chile, most of the other uh, countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are no associations that represent the companies in this ecosystem. There are uh, colleges of translators, associations of translators in most countries in, in Argentina. In particular, there's an extremely well-developed network of colleges of translation across the country. And it's not, it's not uh, a coincidence that you have two national associations of companies here as well. But in many companies, the, there's this great big industry employing a lot of people, as it does, for example, in Quebec. Um, but it's like an iceberg where you can only see a small part of the industry and the rest of it is under the water. It's almost invisible because of the lack of events, the, the lack of conferences, the lack of visibility. Uh, so I uh, talked to a whole bunch of other people in Mexico, in Peru, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Puerto Rico, and said, you know, let's form an association. And together, a joint effort, uh, definitely, definitely not uh, my own uh, work alone here, is a pooled effort of many different people. Um, and we came to the conclusion that uh, we needed to meet uh, because distances are huge in Latin America. It's not like in Europe where you just get on a train and and, and you go from Paris to, to Brussels in an afternoon. Latin America is very big and the infrastructure is not that great for getting around. So we decided that we needed to kickstart Juntos by um, getting together, which of course is what Juntos means, together. That's right. So we're organizing this conference called Vamos Juntos, which means let's go together. Unfortunately, yeah. I just saw a billboard out on the street here with a politician using that exact same phrase, but we had it first. Um, Rio de Janeiro, which is a wonderful place. I mean, it's 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 a place that everyone's heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, either in movies or in cartoons or songs. Everyone has an idea of what Rio de Janeiro is about, but almost nobody seems to have been there. It's amazing of all the attendees that we have signed up, almost nobody has been to Rio before, even though everyone on the planet know, knows where Rio is and what it's about. So um, we thought about having an executive retreat with 20 to 30 leaders and thinkers from Latin America and the Caribbean and Rio. And what's actually happened is we've got over 50 people attending. So we've gone from an executive retreat to a fully blown conference. It's the first time we're organizing this. So obviously some things are gonna go wrong because we're still learning. Um, and we're gonna get together with people from I think 12 different countries, uh, Europe, North America, South America, Central America, Caribbean, and we have an amazing program of speakers. We're going to be talking about continuous education, continuous improvement, standards in the industry, the Brazilian market, the future of the industry, the vision of CEOs and leaders. Uh, it's extremely exciting. Oh, how to sell your translation company. It's, it's very, very exciting. And we really had to squeeze in some amazing presentations that kind of popped up at the last minute unexpectedly. We've already got people who say, I want to contribute. I want to be there. I want to speak. I want to support. I want to sponsor at your event in 2024. So that's amazing. We don't even know where Very we're going to have it. Congratulations. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, really exciting. Uh, and you know, we need to get to this association off the ground and break the ice, meet each other, uh, break bread, and of course, enjoy ourselves at the same time. So who, who can become a member? I guess some of our audience or listeners, if they happen not heard of you yet, which I doubt it because you've been doing such a great job promoting uh, Juntos uh, to everybody on social media, which, um, and I know we have a partnership together with you through the Canadian Language Industry Association here in Canada as well. We're proud to be together on this um, and support you. But how, how, who can become a member and how do they become a member if somebody who's not a member yet already and they desire to be a member? Yes, that is a good question. So um, Juntos is an association that aims to represent the interests of translation, interpreting, and localization companies. So they have to be a company, right, Charles? Right. It has to be, it can be a one-person company or it can be a 300-person company, but it has to be a company. Okay. And the reason why is because it aims to focus on the challenges that companies face that are unique to companies. The objective of the association is to raise the bar of standards in Latin America and the Caribbean in this industry, to um, assist in the process of an increased adoption of international quality norms like ISO or CGSB in Canada, ASTM in the United States, which currently in Latin America and the Caribbean is way behind other areas on the planet. I hate using the expression behind because we're not all on the same racetrack, but in terms of adoption of quality norms, there is a lower level of adoption in Latin America and the Caribbean by companies than in all other places on the planet. We also aim to create opportunities for networking, uh, coaching, benchmarking, and mentoring uh, in our industry between different countries, between Mexico and Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Colombia, where there are many different realities going on, but also a lot of similarities in common threads of thought and, and trends. And so uh, does geography become a factor in becoming a member? Like if somebody from outside Latin America wants to be a member, can they become a member or no? That's a very good question. Um, we have a lot of people who are interested in contributing to Juntos uh, because they either have an interest in Latin America and the Caribbean, you know, the all, I love Brazil or I love Mexico uh, feeling, or, you know, I'm from Colombia, but now I run a translation company in, in Delaware or Virginia or so forth. Uh, there's a lot of people in the translation industry in North America and to a lesser degree, Western Europe, who are from Latin America, who have strong connections to Latin America. It seems that Latin America is the place that you 
you connect to and then you don't let go of the connection, which is wonderful. Look at me, I'm, I'm from New Zealand and I've been living in Latin America for a long time. Uh, so we have a category of membership, which is associate membership for companies that are not in Latin America. Um, it is a Latin America and Caribbean association. So we do want the direction of the association to be in the hands of companies that are in the geographic region. But we are very open to having contributors from outside the geographic region who have a strong interest or, or stakeholder in the region to be involved and to contribute. So the more, the merrier. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's great. Um, and um, the uh, from your, the other flip side of the coin, which we didn't spend too much time on and uh, give you like a few minutes to describe it, I guess, uh, the Spanish back office. For those who don't know about the uh, company, um, what is it, you know, what's the, what's the, um, what's the pitch for, uh, the Spanish back office? I know you're located in Cordoba. I'm looking at the street view of your office. Looks beautiful. I'd love to visit one day. Uh, but just tell me a little bit more about Spanish back office. So, uh, I know you've been, a, you've been in business for since the nineties. Um, and you have a physical location with physical employees on site. Uh, but you know, a little bit more on that one. Can you put some color on it? But it's very interesting because you, you've just demonstrated that you and I go a long way back because we changed our name from Spanish back office to translation back office in 2009. But that just shows there you go. connection. <laughs> so translation back office is a multilingual translation company with offices in Argentina, which is where I live, where I am right now. Uh, also Vietnam. Also, Peru in the capital, Lima. And we used to have an office in the Ukraine in downtown Kiev, but that office is obviously being disbanded because literally bombs fell on the street where the office is located. But we still have the team. They just work from their grandmother's country house or their apartment or generally uh, rural locations. And then some amazing. Okay. I hope they're safe. They are safe and they're extremely resilient, extremely committed. It's in a very, very difficult and hard situation for them. Sometimes they, they have to take a day off or whatever because there's uh, air raid sirens going. It's a very, very difficult situation for them. Um, but they have been extraordinarily resilient and committed to their work with us. And hats off, it's just, uh, it's a story of resilience. I mean, today, I believe today is the anniversary of the day that uh, the invasion started. So it's a story of resilience. No one ever thought that they would have it in them to hold out and not only hold out, but push to a triumph. So uh, the story is not over yet, but uh, our team in Ukraine is absolutely amazing. Uh, so that's where we're spread around the world. Uh, We've worked hard over the years to standardize our internal processes to the point now where we have three different ISO or ISO standards. We have the CGSB standard from Canada. As far as I understand, we are the only company outside North America that has the CGSB standard. We also have the ASTM standard from the United States. And I also believe that we are the only company in the world outside North America that has the ASTM standard. And believe it or not, my operations manager is actually looking at a sixth standard on information security uh, to implement later this year. So we have a very uh, standardized, operationally focused business that provides multilingual translations uh, to clients all around the world. North America would be at least 70% of our business. Uh, our main languages are French and Spanish. But when I say main languages, I mean, they're the biggest. Of course. <clears throat> but we have a very diverse spread of languages from Southeast Asian languages, Eastern European languages, African languages, Western European languages. Uh, so it's a very diverse language mix. But within that language mix, Spanish and French are indeed the largest uh, languages for us at this time. Although as a percentage of the total mix, it, it has been going down over time um, as we become more and more diversified. And well, business is strong, business is healthy. We have a very, very loyal team of project managers, 
vendor managers, business development managers. I mean, there's just so many people here behind the scenes making it all work. It's it's extremely impressive. Congratulations. All of our business is selling translations to other translation companies. We also provide staffing solutions like project managers, vendor managers, quality managers, um, customer service managers, to other translation companies in the century. That's a really important and growing area of our business as, as our clients struggle to find people in the United States and Canada and Western Europe, they come to us to help them augment their internal staffing on a temporary or permanent basis. So, you know, business is good and people are passionate. So uh, not much more you can ask for, really. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, our business is uh, is the horizontal service that goes across multiple industries, multiple uh, uh, countries, etc. So it's one of, I, I say like, the language industry has been around since the eight, 10,000 years ago, since, you know, I've, I mean, they, they take it back to the Babylon day. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that's, I guess, the, the, the earlier reference that we can, that we can use. Uh, and that industry will stay around for as long as there's humanity somewhere. Um, and, I, and I agree with you in your earlier statement. I'd, it doesn't matter what technologies gets uh, introduced or somebody think about down the road. Um, I, I do believe that there's a human in the middle that always going to be involved, either in programming, training the machine, or uh, you know, handling the aspects that you just mentioned. You know, the project management, the coordination, the customer service part. Uh, those are human effort that you cannot. Uh, you, know, you know, it's always going to be there. And it's always going to be needed. Some aspect of the tasking modules that could be probably taken to a machine. Uh, but there is a human in the middle that always going to be around um, and, and it's always going to be prosperous and growing. And so to close on, and I know we still have a couple of minutes, I know you're on a tight schedule. So to close off the conversation. So what do you think of this conversation, this initiative that I um, started a few weeks ago? And to be honest with you, it's really taken off. Like I've got calendar booked till <laughs> for two months from now, and we record these events on a Friday morning, as I told you, but what do you think of this uh, conversation? Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you today, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, sit down and, and have a back and forth exchange about where we think see things going from our different standpoints, different levels of experience. A bit of a trip down memory lane for me there when you mentioned Spanish back office. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, I congratulate you for this initiative. And we were spread out, you know, different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So uh, it's great to connect, reconnect, uh, or meet for the first time. Uh, I don't think that this type of initiative should replace, however, face-to-face -face meetings, um, breaking bread together and rolling up our sleeves and getting, and getting on working together. I do love working side by side with people um, as well. But uh, this is wonderful. So thank you for involving me. I really appreciate it. And thanks, Charles, for uh, coming on uh, online with me here for this for this event. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy guy, but uh, thanks again. And uh, look forward to talking to you in the future. And good luck on the conference in Rio. Again, I promise yeah. every effort to be there. I'll, I'll see you there. So it's March 24, March 25 in Rio de Janeiro this year. Uh, we haven't even started planning next year. So we'll see you there. And if you need more information, you can just reach out to me. I'm pretty easy to find uh, on LinkedIn. Thank you, Charles, again. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you.